Good evening. I think we're uh, at a time when it's ready to start, and since I'm running out of ways to give any, giving an opening prayer that's any different than the one I did last week and the week before and the week before, I asked Bob Yates to give our opening prayer tonight. Bob said he had to think, so I said, well, you can now tell everybody what you thought about. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I have to think, it doesn't last long. <laughs> that happens in a hurry. A couple of updates. Tamara had her knee surgery yesterday and came through just fine, and she's at home recovering. And uh, Jerry Brock was admitted to CHI in Hot Springs last night with a urinary tract infection. And uh, I talked to Jerry this morning, and... Uh, they admitted him to the hospitals from the simple fact that uh, they just didn't want an infection to transfer over to his kidneys. So they're just watching him. So keep uh, tomorrow and keep Jerry in your prayers. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we are so grateful. We are certainly grateful, God, that we know and we understand creation and we understand your power as far as humans can understand it. We understand that you made this earth and everything in it. And Father, as we go through these lessons, it's, it's good for us to see what others think and what their basis of this thinking is. Uh, and, and we can apply that and look at it and look at what your word says and and again, we, we know that the truth comes out. So, Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word that we have to rely on. Be with Bill this evening as he brings this information to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Uh, tonight we're going to go back and look at a summary of the last three DVDs. If we were in one of the small classrooms, I'd probably have a blank screen up there, and uh, I'd say, well, what were they? And of course, everybody would snap the answer out just like that, right? Uh, the first one is a given. See, it's up there. Can life come from non-life and turn into you? That was one we saw, well, however you want to count the weeks, three weeks ago. The second one was, do textbooks prove evolution? And then last week, we saw one that talked about um, something else, <laughs> whether or not fossils prove evolution. Yeah, here I am standing here. Um, Mike Anderson made a, we were talking a little bit before we started tonight, and he said, you know, the last two I can kind of relate to. It got down to something I could, I could really understand, or at least I'm familiar with. That's part of the problem. How many of us can say before we started this, and I'm not one of them, that you knew that there were basic fundamental scientific laws, laws, naturalistic laws, developed and written by, not created by, but developed and mathematically derived and through a multitude of observation and experimentation, developed something that never has been violated and turned it into a law. How many of us knew that the theory of evolution violates a whole bunch of them? Anyone want to raise their hand? There's one. Good. That's good. Generally speaking, though, we don't get that stuff. We never read it. We never see it. Um, I think it's one of these DVDs that Dr. Miller alluded to the fact you have to read scientific, you have to read uh, the, the in-depth journals that only the graduate students and the scientists themselves read to get, well, I could use a Wizard of Oz comparison, to get behind the curtain and see what the wizard is doing. The average public only gets what we saw the last couple of weeks, the pictures of Haeckel's uh, embryonic theory, the, the human being going, we've all seen it, he goes from, you know, a, a small ape-like figure and he gets a little bigger, a little bigger, and he he's hunched back, and then he, he starts to straighten up. We've all seen that. 
Yeah, that's right. But did we know that a lot of those um, humans were based on one tooth or one toe and that they hired artists to come in and draw something conceptually? My answer is I didn't. And that's part of the problem. We haven't seen that. And to really fundamentally understand this stuff, that's why we went through this. And I think that's why Dr. Miller in the seminar did it that way. So we can lay a foundation that fully expands what the problems are with this theory, other than the fact that common sense kind of tells us we didn't descend from apes. I mean, we kind of think that, but scientifically, we can show it. So tonight, we'll start out by reviewing what Dr. Miller said about whether life can come from non-life and turn into us. We kind of laid the groundwork for this um, just ahead of showing this DVD. We went over an experiment that was done in, I think it was 1953, by Stanley Miller at the University of Chicago, where if you remember, uh, we had a sketch up there that looked like a crazy concoction of tubes and be uh, beakers and, and whatevers. And what he did was he took what they thought the, the atmosphere of the Earth was way back when, what gases were involved and how many and all that stuff. And the idea was that an electric uh, event took place, lightning, and the spark caused life to begin. Miller was able to create 23 amino acids. Well, that sounds like a start. Amino acid is a very fundamental building block of life. So, hmm, maybe he's onto something. He never got any further because the next step is to create a protein. And that was the reason <clears throat> we looked at what a protein constitutes. It's not easy. We looked at one protein, the collagen protein, and we saw that it's a triple helix. We saw that it has to have the precise um, amino acids or it isn't a protein, and that those proteins have to be arranged in a precise arrangement or it's not a protein. We also talked a little bit about the hemoglobin protein. If there's one thing wrong with it, you've got the potential for sickle cell anemia. That's all it takes. This stuff is very precise, it's very exacting, and that's what Stanley Miller was up against when he was trying to recreate life. That's kind of a lead-in to Dr. Miller's DVD in which he talked about this. The first thing he talked about was another law, the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis states very clearly, it's very simple, it's not a hard law. Life only comes from life and that of its own kind. Emphasis on the word kind. You're going to hear that again. You already have because you know Genesis 1. Nevertheless, the law of biogenics says the same thing, biogenesis, that life only comes from life. Cells produce cells, and they produce cells of a like kind with the same chromosomes, the same, the, the same constitution that they had before. It doesn't come from a rock or a pebble or a bolt of lightning. It comes from life. This violates or is, in, in, is contradictory to what the evolutionists say, which is that life somehow came from non-life, the term abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. Dr. Miller discussed three different scientists who studied that. Two of them were, uh, if I remember, they were Italians, and they go back several hundred years, but the one that he focused on was a, a, a name we probably all know in one way or another, Louis Pasteur. His experiment in 1864 proved, with, with little doubt, if any doubt, that abiogenesis is impossible. It can't happen. Life only comes from life. Bottom line, the experiments that we've done, we humans, scientists, don't show us that life can come from non-life. What they show us is what the law of biogenesis says. Life only comes from life. And these, the continuing experiments that scientists conduct continue to prove that law. That's why it's a law. It's never been violated. Evolutionists are, are stuck with having to rationalize this. They admit 
They don't know how life started. Um, I, I'm not going to recant them because if we did that, we'd have to play the DVD again, but Dr. Miller cited all kinds of scientists, evolutionists, and atheists who basically admit they don't know, and yet they hang on to the possibility that somewhere out there it happened. We don't know how, but we're going to keep looking, and we're going to find it. Part of the reason for that is that they refuse to accept the idea or the concept of a supernatural being. They will not accept God. They are naturalists, and they are only looking at this through the lens of natural events. And they've put, put themselves in a box and don't allow God or a supernatural being to come into this box and create events that allow for life to occur, in this case, in what we're talking about. One other way they've kind of dodged the issue is to say, well, our evolution theory only talks about how life evolved. We don't talk about how life started. And I'll borrow a little bit of sarcasm from Dr. Miller and say, well, that's kind of a dodge. If you're gonna have a theory about evolution, if you're gonna have a theory about life, if you're gonna have a theory about how things were created, you gotta define and figure out how they were created. And they can't do it, they haven't done it. Um, they've gotten to the point where they've speculated um, that aliens are out there. And we'll get back to them in a minute. I wanna cover the, the one bullet that's up there. They talk about evolution being about only the changes that have occurred. Even Darwin said that. If we go way back to the very first um, lesson we had, uh, I think somewhere in there we acknowledge that Charles Darwin himself said, I'm only addressing how life changed, how it evolved. I'm not, changed, I'm not talking about how it started because I never observed anything. And to be fair, he was honest <laughs> in this case. He said, I, I didn't observe it, I didn't look into it, I don't know, and I'm not going to address it. Uh, the origin of species addressed how life evolved. I'm not going to talk about how it was created. So he dodged it. A minute ago, I, I started talking a little bit about aliens. I don't have it up there on the chart, but uh, Dr. Miller talked about the fact that the, the evolutionists have gotten desperate enough to now to where they're saying, well, there's aliens out there, and they came here at some point way in the past and seeded this planet. First of all, you, you, you got to blink to believe that. But even if you do, it's a circular argument because aliens, if they exist, are living creatures. So how did they get created? You've tried to dodge the question of how we were created, but all you've done is create the same question by saying there's some kind of life form out there that we've never seen, never heard of, um, and, and our, it's, it's sheer speculation that they're out there, but you still get back to the fundamental question. How did they get created? There's no answer for that either. Um, but what about creation? What about the creation account? What Dr. Miller pointed out, and I think what all of us know is, the creation account in Genesis is totally consistent. God breathed life into man. God created this, the creatures of the sea and the land. It's all spelled out very simply in Genesis. And he even went so far in telling us in three different verses that we are created according to our own kind. Totally consistent with a law that we now have defined and understand as the law of biogenesis. You can take the very last bullet up there and tie it right back up to the top, the very first one, and see that the creation model, in its own words, in God's own words through Moses, says that we are created each of our own kind. The law of biogenesis says life only comes from life and that of its own kind. Evolutionists, refuse to accept this because they have boxed themselves into a view that is only allowing naturalistic 
uh, events to, to enter into their thinking. And they've locked themselves out for the answer. So when they say they don't know, it's more of they don't accept. From there, and there was, as you know, a whole lot of other stuff that I'm not going to cover. But what Dr. Miller, in, in what I just showed you, was addressing was, can life come from non-life? Then he got into what I'll say is the second part of the question, and, there, and turn into you, or me, or any of us. And he talked about that. And what he said was something we said way back in the first uh, uh, session we had, and we've, we've mentioned it a few other times, is that when Charles Darwin developed his theory and his origin of species, as Dr. Miller acknowledged and as we discussed in week one, this wasn't new. The idea that there was some form of evolution wasn't a brand new concept. It had been kicked around for hundreds of years, if not millennia. Darwin, as Dr. Miller said, came along at a very opportune time put together you know, some really, I think, good observations that he made on his, on his worldwide trip on the Beagle. I think he drew the wrong conclusions and he developed the wrong theory, but he, he defined for science a mechanism for evolution to occur and that was called natural selection. And natural selection is defined as being species that are selected that are most fit to a particular environment. In other words, as time moves on, a species will survive or not survive based on its ability to adapt to its environment within itself. Um, and that was a mechanism that scientists did not have, and, and they latched onto that, and then over time, more and more scientists latched onto it, and around the 1930s and 40s, it really got, got uh, uh, accepted widely after Mendel's experiments. But what it does is perhaps explains the survival of the fittest once we're here, or once an animal is here, or a plant, but it doesn't explain the arrival of the fittest. It filters species. If a species doesn't adapt, microevolution, something that creationists are very comfortable with, small changes, if it doesn't adapt to its environment, then it very likely could die out and natural selection does have a role in explaining that. But it doesn't explain the creation. It explains it's, it's only a filtering mechanism. Scientists recognized uh, over the years there was some shortfalls to the uh, idea of natural selection, the Darwin's theory. So they adopted what they call neo-Darwinism. Darwinism. They added the idea that natural selection along with genetic mutations is what moves things along and allows creatures and plants to evolve. This is the idea that once in a while you get a genetic mutation, it changes the species, and all of a sudden you've got something that's moved along in its evolutionary track. The problem with mutations is they don't create new information. You need, if, and he used the example, if humans are gonna evolve to where we, had, we grow wings, because it's gonna be better for us to be able to fly, at least a little bit, we gotta have genetic material to allow wings to develop. A genetic mutation, that's new information. A genetic mutation doesn't do that. What a mutation does, and he outlined it, it changes what's already there. That's all it does. And it changes by duplicating something, by translocating it, in other words, moving it from one place to another, or by deleting it. Sometimes it might enhance a species, a small amount, gradualism, a little, a tiny change. Maybe it's for the good, maybe it's not for the good. But that's microevolution. That's not moving from one species to another, which is what Darwin's theory is. And it's not moving apes to humans, which is what evolutionists believe. So it doesn't explain anything as far as either the creation or the evolution of a species because it doesn't create new stuff. The, gene, the genetic pool, the genetic uh, makeup of our genes hasn't had anything added to it. Maybe change a little bit, maybe for the good, and maybe not so good. 
there, as you know, in the DVD, there was a whole lot more, but those are kind of the, the, the points I, I tried to capture for you. Um, the next one we saw, and this is, Mike, where we get into stuff we've seen before, so we'll get a little more comfortable with this, because we all saw this stuff in school. This is what we got. This is what our kids got. This is what our grandkids got or are getting, and this is what our great-grandkids are getting. Now, maybe some of it's been dropped. Maybe there's been a little more information up here, but what Dr. Miller started out talking about was a series of things that, appeared in, that have appeared in textbooks over the years. He started out with something called the biogenic law, <clears throat> which is a law not to be accused, uh, accused, well, that's a good word too, not to be confused with the law of biogenesis, not at all. This was a, a law or a theory developed by a fellow named Ernest Haeckel. I don't know about you, but I, saw, I remember seeing the chart. The idea was that embryos repeat the evolution of their species. So if you remember, he had that, that chart and he had different columns. I think one was a pig. Uh, there were a bunch of things, and there were humans up there. And the idea is, as we develop in the womb, we go through the evolution that we've gone through to get where we are. This is proven to be false. Part of it was that at some point in our early development, we have, what are, we have gills. Well, the idea there was that we were once in the water and that uh, we emerged from the water and went on from there. We never have gills when we're in the womb. What we have are some mus muscle tissue in that area that presumably somebody might say, oh, that's a gill. It's not, it doesn't function as that when we're in the womb. It's not a gill. We don't go through our evolutionary cycle while we're in the womb. That's been pretty well proven. I won't even say pretty well. It's been disproven, period. But that isn't the whole story. As Dr. Miller pointed out, Heckel falsified the information. I was looking for the right verb. He, he took some drawings and duplicated them under different animals so that it fit. And he, he replaced some of his drawings with fake drawings. It was fake science. He finally, uh, they have apparently, and Dr. Miller alluded to it, have some kind of board that meets or some kind of Supreme Court for scientists, and they found him guilty of this. And what was his answer? The answer was basically, well, yeah, I feel bad about this, but everyone else does it. You, Dr. Miller said that, that puts a lot of credibility around how much belief and trust we should have in science when you have a scientist like this who is out falsifying uh, his own theory just to make it right. Another item that uh, Dr. Miller addressed was homologous structures. This is the idea that four-limbed vertebrates, as an example, have descended with some modifications from a common ancestor. <clears throat> Dr. Miller went through some logic that said, that's not rational. The dissimilarities that we all have show that there is no common ancestor. The similarities show that we were designed to be what we are. Four legs, four limbs make sense not only for humans, we have four, we walk on two of them, but we have four limbs. All kinds of mammals have four limbs. Having a common design doesn't mean we came from the same species, we were designed by a common designer, and he used the example of cars made by General Motors. They're all pretty much similar in, in a very basic way. It's no different here. The dissimilarities show that there is no common ancestor. I'm going to come back to this in, in uh, you know, some of the other discussion, but it shows that each species is its own species, and they're all out on their own, and there's no connectivity. <clears throat> this next um, element that uh, Dr. Miller addressed, genetic similarities, uh, he went through a lot of stuff that I don't have up here. I'll try to cover some of it, but the idea is that similar species, and I'll use humans and chimps as an example, have a large percentage of our genes that are the same. In the case of humans and chimpanzees, it's 95% or more. So as Dr. Miller said, well, that sounds like a high number. Uh, maybe that, you know, and that has been 
one of the arguments for uh, supporting the idea of evolution. That 5% is a big deal. It, it, it equates to 200 million cells being different. And it does not allow for qualitative differences. It's a number. Does a chimp have a funeral or a burial service for a loss of a, a, loss of a loved one? Does a chimp, are they capable of taking something they see and putting it on a canvas? Can a chimp create a symphony like Beethoven did? These are qualitative differences that we have, and Dr. Miller really didn't address that too much, but um, it, it, it all gets into this. He also talked about the idea of, and he, he went into quite a bit of detail about chromosomes. We have 48, or 46 chromosomes, chimp have, chimps have 48. And he, again, he said, well, that's, that sounds close, but that's a big difference. And if you remember, he, he uh, compared the number of, of uh, chromosomes that we have, the number of chromosomes that other plants and animals have, you would expect the more complex the animal is, the more chromosomes it would have. Not the case, not the case at all. And that uh, I can't remember what it was, but the, the species that has the same number of chromosomes as humans is something that we're not even close to. I, I think he made a reference to daffodils and says, is a daffodil a human? The, the chromosomes have no, no relationship to this. He mentioned horse evolution. I'm gonna kind of speed through these a little bit. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit. That was commonly accepted as a beautiful example of, of evolution. It's been discounted. I think a lot of us saw that in school. I know I did. Um, and now uh, evolution has sort of discarded that as a good example of evolution, whale ev evolution. This one was interesting because it, uh, scientists uh, contended that whale evolution was well documented. And, it was, and the documentation showed that whales descended from hippos. And at some point, hippos got into the water so they could get food better and eventually evolved into whales. Now evolution are saying, no, 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 no. Whales evolved from a raccoon-like mammal from Africa. He showed a picture of it. It's about the size of a raccoon. And it's based on similarities of their teeth. The raccoon is a herbivore. It eats plants. Whales are carnivores. They eat animals, stuff. If, it's well, if it was well documented, how can you make such a huge leap? Sounds like it wasn't very well documented. And quite frankly, if you want my personal opinion, it doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. The, the last item he got into here is vestigial organs. We're familiar with a lot of this, but the idea here is that as species evolve, we have organs that no longer become useful or necessary. There is no evidence of this anywhere, no, no empirical evidence. Looking around this room, if this was true, it would seem reasonable that one or two or five of us would have some organ that has disappeared, and others of us would still have it because we're evolving and we haven't all gotten there. That isn't true. We're all pretty much the same when it comes to this. We've all got the same organs. He went through <clears throat> about, uh, oh, and he also mentioned at one point, one of the scientists listed 86 vestigial organs that humans have had that are vestigial. They're no longer needed, they're no longer part of us, and they've either disappeared or will disappear, or they're useless. They've all fallen off the list. Scientists have found that they all have a use. I'm just going to go through and enumerate uh, the ones that Dr. Miller went through, the appendix. We all know about the appendix. We all know that it's no big deal, it's useless. Well, it turns out it's part of our immune system. With kids, it produces white blood cells. It's uh, proportionately larger than it is in adults because they need more protection. And it produces good bacteria. Think probiotics. So it does have a use. Tonsils. Again, I know when I was a kid, it was pretty common to have your tonsils removed if they got infected. I didn't. Um, 
but I, I remember as a kid, the, the, a lot of kids had them removed. You got to eat ice cream. That was, the, that was the, the big deal. They do have a use. They fight germs. They're not useless. Uh, if we were in the classroom, I'd have a pointer, and I could point to where they are. They're at the back of the throat. The coccyx. That's our tailbone. <clears throat> the idea there was, well, this is the remnants of a tail. Because after all, we, defended, we uh, descended from apes, right? Well, actually, uh, monkeys, apes don't have tails. No, the coccyx is important. It's a shock absorber. If we didn't have it, try sitting down on a hard seat. Try sitting down at all. And it's a point of attachment for pelvic muscles to enable us to walk. Huh? Useless? Are you kidding me? Hair, I didn't show a picture of hair, but um, it protects us. It's there for a reason, especially in our heads. It provides warmth. It's an alarm system. It's not useless. It's not vestigial. Wisdom teeth, that's another one that's pretty common. They get impacted. I've got all four of mine are gone. But the reason isn't because we're evolving to get rid of them. The reason is we have soft diets, especially in Western culture. And that causes the teeth to move around, wedge up against each other, become impacted, cause pain, and therefore we get them taken out. They're not evolving their way out. We're taking them out because our diet and our way of living is causing these problems to occur. And finally, you talked about junk DNA. Uh, scientists have felt that there's DNA within the helix there that is, isn't of any use. It's hardly the case. Now they're discussing that all DNA is useful. So bottom line, what do textbooks do textbooks prove evolution? If anything, they disprove it. Last week, we talked about fossils. And Dr. Miller went over some of the fossils. Uh, he said, this is the big one. This is the one that, that the uh, evolutionists say proves, you know, we got the fossils, you lose. I, there was a chart he used that said, I paraphrased it, something like that. Well, what's the answer? To this point, what we're seeing is that fossils don't exist that show transitional features. We haven't found any. Now, Dr. Miller went through a lot more dialogue on this, but basically, if you take a look at, and he talked mainly about human evolution, if you want to use that term and accept it from me, we haven't found transitional preachers. We haven't found any evidence in the fossil record. Take that and extrapolate it to the idea that if you're going to have evolution and you're going to believe in what Darwin said, that we all came from one single cell, whatever, that developed somewhere in the water somewhere, you must, you must have a whole bunch of transitional features and creatures and evidence of that. Logic would tell you that if, you, if the evolution theory is true, you're going to find all kinds of these things. Haven't found them. The creation model or the creation account would suggest that each creature was created as a fully formed functional creature. And that's all we've found. That's all that the fossil record has found. Why, why is it so hard? Well, first of all, relative, it may sound like they found a lot of them. Relatively few have been found. For all the digging and stirring things up in Eastern Africa and Europe and Asia and all over the place, I think he made the reference that one of the evolutionists said that all of the fossil evidence, quote unquote, could fit in one coffin for human, so-called so human evolution. They don't find much stuff. <clears throat> when they do find, well, let me go back. When they do find them, it's sporadic. You might find a bone here and a bone there and a couple of bones here in the relative same area but you don't find them all together where you can put the whole thing together. It's very sporadic. You find a toe bone here and maybe a piece of a skull over there and maybe a, a finger over here or whatever, but you don't find it all together. I just alluded to it, but um, not only sporadic, but they're partial. He mentioned, and this is why Lucy got so much attention, 40% is a big deal you don't find 40% of too many specimens. 
So because they're sporadic and because they find so few of a species, it's very hard to piece together and, and identify a species, and scientists often make mistakes. And you, in a way, you can't blame them. We wouldn't be any different. If I got a toe bone here and a tooth over there and a partial skull here, what, can, what conclusion can I draw from it? But evolutionists are so enamored of trying to, to support their theory and prove it that over and over again, they create these creatures out of almost thin air, if you think about a tooth. Um, the evidence that we do find is in harmony with creation. I, I don't have it in front of me, but we could go to Genesis 20, uh, 1, 24 and 25. Um, there is simply no fossil evidence for evolution, it doesn't exist. And that was the point that Dr. Miller made in this segment. From there, he talked about some of the fossil records that we've seen, and some of us are familiar with these. He talked about the Piltdown Man. This was a, um, a skull fragment um, that turned out to be from a modern man. It was found in England. I think it was in a, 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 a tar pit, if I remember right. Later research showed that the skull fragment they found was from a modern man, the jawbone uh, was from an ape, and here's the sad part, the teeth were doctored. They filed them and they stained them to look old. Now it's one thing for science to draw the wrong conclusion because they don't have much evidence and much to go on. It's another thing when it's fraudulent, and that's very sad. Uh, we, you know, I've mentioned that twice, uh, uh, even tonight with Heckel and with the uh, Piltdown man. So the Piltdown Man doesn't contribute to the idea of transition. Another one they found was called the Java Man. They found some bones in the Dutch Indies in the 1890s, uh, a thigh, jawbone, and a skull cap. Turned out the thigh and the jawbone, later research, came from modern humans. They weren't old. The skull cap, they found two of them. One, turned out, was from a monkey, and the other one is the kneecap of an elephant. As Dr. Miller said, no transition there, moving right along. And I remember these, I don't know about you, but I remember the Piltdown Man and the Java Man, but I don't remember ever hearing that they weren't evidence of it. I, I never heard that the Piltdown Man was falsified. And I never heard that the Java Man consisted of bones that had nothing to do with an ancient so-called transitional creature. Then there's the Nebraska Man, this is one where a tooth was found, I believe it was on a farm in Nebraska in 1917. They took five years to analyze it, finally came out with a paper. It was based on one tooth. Uh, even the scientists at the time were a little bit leery of this, and they found out that the tooth came from a wild pig. They almost used it as evidence in the Scopes trial. The Scopes trial was in 1925, and... Um, the defense team for Scopes decided maybe we better not use this because it was, also be, it was already being rumored that this thing wasn't very real. And yet, you saw that Dr. Miller showed a sketch that they had done showing an entire species out of this one tooth that turns out to be from a pig, and they're showing a, 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 a guy and, and his, you know, his mate and they got a hut, and they're, they're doing stuff. You could go on the internet and probably find it. And the tooth turns out to be from a wild boar or some kind of wild pig. The Orsi man, um, I didn't know about this one until I read about it here and, and heard Dr. Miller talk about it. Uh, found a skull cap in Spain. They thought it was a child. Turned out it was a six-month-old donkey. That was where the skull, was from, the skull fragment was from. Uh, he didn't mention it. I did a little bit re of reading on this, but this was a, a very controversial uh, item at, at the time because of the way it was presented to the press and the way it was publicized. It was presented as the oldest fossil of a human being ever found in Europe. And that gets to the point that Dr. Miller made. If you want to get your specimen on the front co cover of Nature or Science magazine, it's got to be different. It can't be an Australopithecine. If I got that right. I don't know if I got all the syllables. Brian, you'll have to correct me on that. 
But nah, that, that's, that's science jargon. And this, this sounds like an example of it. They, they, you know, somebody wanted this to be a big deal. Turned out it wasn't. So we see a whole bunch of these things that turn out not to be proof of transitional creatures. They all disappeared. Now, I didn't mention some, and you might be scratching your head, uh, Neanderthals and stuff like that. You might be wondering where they went. This particular slide is the, is the one slide that's a little different from what you heard on the DVD, and that's because this represents the one thing that Dr. Miller said was a little different from what he presented in the DVD. So what I'm going to tell you here is what the more current thinking is from when the DVD was cut about um, six or seven years ago. What creation scientists are beginning to think is that a lot of these so-called transitional creatures were really human. The scientists find them. They find a few bones here and a few bones there, and they, you know, they have bones connected to the thigh bone and all that, and pretty soon you got a drawing of a creature. No, Tammy, I won't put that one out. That's, that's, that, that, I'm not gonna, we're not going to record that. Um, but what creation scientists are now beginning to think is some of these creatures, these so-called transitional creatures, are really just humans. They're a, they're a member of the human family. And there's a lot of variety. They're finding a lot of variety in the, in the scant uh, fossils they find, just as there's a lot of variety today. But they're beginning to see that they have basically human characteristics. They're no different than us. The Neanderthals are probably the most uh, obvious example of this. Uh, they're the ones that have led to the caricature of the caveman and the stooped over guy. And the, uh, the article I read in uh, the Smithsonian even begged the question, was Fred, Fred Flintstone a Neanderthal? He, he was kind of patterned after that. And as Dr. Miller alluded, and I think some of you know, that the Neanderthal findings really have now been found out to be an old man who had osteoarthritis. He was bent over because he had arthritis. And the skull cap that they found was from a child who had rickets. In other words, scientists were misled and drew, con and, and, and I'm not necessarily blaming them for this. It's easy to get misled, but you gotta have, you gotta be objective about it. And they jumped to the conclusion that this race, this was a separate race that got wiped out, it's extinct, and it was some transitional creature. When in fact, what more current science is showing us is they were human. The, um, Dr. Miller alluded to the fact that they have found human bones, and when I say that I mean sapien type bones, mixed in with the Neanderthals, and if you believe their dating techniques, and we're, Dr. Miller's gonna talk about that next week in the DVD, they're older than the Neanderthals. Well, if they're older than the Neanderthals, how did we descend from the Neanderthals? That doesn't make sense. And the article I read in the Smithsonian was just the opposite. It said that they have now found that Neanderthals drew, put drawings on caves before humans, so-called humans, sapiens, were around. If that all sounds confusing, the answer is simple. They were humans. They were like us. And the article went on to say, and, and I brought it along so I could read this to you. I didn't want to just blurt this out because I figured I'd get it wrong. <clears throat> the real game changer came in 2013 when after decades long effort to decode ancient DNA, the Max Planck Institute published the entire Neanderthal genome. It turns out that if you're of European or Asian descent, up to 4% of your DNA was inherited directly from Neanderthals. Anyone want to say they weren't human? Another uh, creature that was mentioned was the Heidelberg man. And the idea there was that he had, that this find was it was a big jawbone. And Dr. Miller made the, the reference to uh, I think it was um, the wrestler. Oh, can't think of his name now. Um, or Goliath. Oh, Andre the Giant. <clears throat> or Goliath. Hey, I'm 5'8". If Shaq O'Neal is standing next to me, 
I got a hunch his jawbone is bigger than mine. Anyone want to dispute that? I know his height is, but the point is the, the so-called Heidelberg man, which they rushed to the conclusion that this was a separate species, was a human. He was a big guy. We don't have to look too far in our own history. Sometimes average people look up to people who are big guys. It happens. We had three of them in our own history that we all know, Jefferson, Washington, and Lincoln. They were all big guys. But the average person in the late 1700s and mid-1800s wasn't even as tall as us. It happens. The Heidelberg man, for all intents and purposes, he's just a big guy. He's a human. <clears throat> the Peking man, that's the bones that were find, found near Beijing. Well, we don't know too much about them because they disappeared. I'll leave it at that. I mean, I don't know what to say. What, what can you say? They're gone. Um, and then finally, the Cro-Magnons. I don't know about you, but everything I've ever read on this topic is basically the, the Cro-Magnons were human. I, I, they were, you know, supposedly the last ones in the tree, uh, but they're basically human. Um, but the thinking now is among creation scientists is that these, these identification of these fossils and naming of them as separate individual creatures, at least in some cases, is nothing more than humans. And the evolutionists rushed to the idea that they were different, they were somewhere on the evolutionary tree when in fact they were just like us. I'm running a little late tonight, I apologize for that. I'll just try to cover this real quickly. The desperation that evolutionists have now come to is to develop a concept called punctuated equilibrium. <laughs> that's, that's quite a mouthful. Basically what they're saying is because they can't find any fossil records to support evolution or transition, they're saying, well, it didn't, it, it, we had a burst of animals and plants and then things just drifted along with very small change and there wasn't any time to develop the fossils. That's why you don't find them. <clears throat> Does somebody want to tell me what that sounds like? Anyone? Anyone want to read Genesis 1 for us? Of course things came out all of a sudden. God created them quickly in a day. Or maybe two days if you want to really get into the count. But the point is, of course they were created quickly. Uh, he alluded to the Cambrian um, explosion, which, again, getting into the dating stuff, I won't get, get too delve into that too much. They're, they're now thinking it was 530 million years ago. Uh, we'll hear more about that next week. But there was an explosion of life. Well, what does that sound like? Here are the evolutionists coming up with ideas and concepts that come right out of a creationist mind. Of course it, it was an explosion. God caused the explosion. Okay, that's what I got. Uh, I hope that added a little bit to what you saw the last three weeks. We're going to make one modification in the, in the class. Um, the elders um, and Steve have decided that we want to start the uh, Wednesday night and Sunday morning class, the normal pre-COVID class structure, on June 2nd. So I'm going to eliminate one class that we we're going to have, the one we we're going to have next week. And so we'll show the DVD, we'll show two more weeks of DVDs, and then I'll come back and do a wrap-up on them and kind of wrap the whole, the co whole course up in one night, if you can believe that. Uh, that'll, go, that'll be quick. Um, but what I will do is send you the notes of what I would have shown next week. I have them all prepared, and you can read them over. You'll get them in the email. It's three topics. One is the Scopes trial. That's most of the material, the Scopes monkey trial. The, um, a little bit of, on Lucy. You've heard Lucy referred to, so there's some stuff on that. And the third part is something we really haven't mentioned. It's a family, uh, a parent, parents and a son. Their name is Leakey. And they were very instrumental and influential in uh, paleontology work in Eastern Africa. 
and they're the ones who kind of moved the focus of paleontology from Europe and Asia, and it's centered on Eastern Africa, and you'll see some material about them, and they made a lot of discoveries too. So that's, that's what I'll do. I'll send that email out to you, and then next week we'll see the DVD. It's titled, uh, if I remember right, Do Dating Techniques Prove Evolution? Thank you. Sorry I went over a little bit tonight.